Cornerstone Church. How's everybody today? Good. Good, good. good. Special day today. Uh, you get me as your MC. And uh, Crystal's leading us today. Yes, that's right. We have a special speaker this morning, too, Miranda Valentini. She'll be here to share with us. So, yay. And that sounded like not like an enthusiastic day, but I really am enthusiastic about being here. <laughs> Sorry, Miranda. I didn't mean for it to, like, I don't know. There's a little bit of love about all that, you know. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, why don't we stand and we'll begin our morning in worship.
seated. You may be seated. Uh, bringing the announcements this morning, of course, because Dan and Wendy are away at uh, National Conference. Actually, it's over now. Um, <laughs> it was just like Friday to Saturday, if you think about it. Um, but I'm sure they're having a wonderful time. And um, really, just what's going on here is yeah, we have a lineup of special speakers coming this month, uh, beginning today with Miranda. And we have another chaplain, Dan Noel. He's coming from Lighthouse Cafe. Um, weeks, I believe that's August 27th. I left my list at the back, so none of you guys can go. And um, as well, on uh, September 3rd, I believe we have Teen Challenge coming uh, to bring just a testimony of uh, what it is of the work they do and how they help those in recovery. And uh, so, it's, you know, it's going to be a great month. Um, yeah, I believe that's all, guys. I'm just thinking on the cuff here, but uh, I know Julianne wants to share a special announcement, but I don't think there's anything else I have to say, so I will invite her up to come and share at this time.
Um, I did pray for healing. I did pray for restoration and wholeness. I did pray that God would do what seemed to be impossible. Um, I prayed that through it all, he would somehow bring glory to himself. And I also prayed uh, on more than one occasion that if our story ended in heartache and loss, that um, we would have strength to cling to him and to worship him through it all um, because he is worthy whether things turn out the way we had hoped or not. And now, after all that has happened and just to see how amazingly good God has been, um, I almost feel like I didn't pray big enough or ask God for big enough things um, or ask him to move in bigger ways that I now realize that are entirely possible for him even when things seemed uncertain for us. And yet God answered all of our prayers in ways that were way bigger than what I was asking for. So all of this to give you happy and to say thank you. Um, many of you have been praying with us. Many of you have been reaching out and asking uh, for updates about how my brother is doing. <coughs> so thank you very much. And um, of course, I want to give all the thanks and praise to God who has shown himself to be so good and so faithful and present with us in very real ways um, this past year. And this makes me think of the verse in Ephesians, which says, to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and throughout all generations. And so that phrase just sticks out to me, exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or imagine. And this verse has become very real to me through all of this. And what an amazing testimony I now have, my family now has, um, my kids now have, you know, to the greatness of God and to the very real and practical ways he has met our needs. And so I realized I had to share this with you, not to just give you an update, especially because some of you keep asking, which I so appreciate, um, but because um, it really seems to me that this is what being a body of Christ together is about. Praying together, but then also rejoicing together so that you also hopefully may be encouraged in your faith and that so God can be further glorified as you hear what he has done and doing currently in our lives um, and then you can join us in praising and thanking. Will you join me in your eyes? Join me as uh, we continue worship.
Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this place we call our church and uh, your people to come and gather and worship your name. What a blessing it is, Lord, to come here together as your people. After having just heard the miracles of your works, Lord, I rejoice in that. Thank you, Lord, for these times where we hear the works that you've done. Uh, yes, Lord, to encourage our hearts and fill us up. And I do pray that that is what's happening now, Lord. I pray your spirit will go before us here, God, preparing our hearts for what we are going to hear. And Lord, you know the things that we brought forward here today on our hearts and our minds. You know them better than we do, even God. So, Lord, uh, I ask you to help us leave them here with you. Lord, could we just leave them all here for you to pick up as your word calls us to do? Um, we are happy to be here, Lord. Happy to be worshiping you today. And we thank you, God. We thank you for your beautiful, multicultural, cultural, intergenerational family gathering today in so many countries. Deliver us, we pray, from dead religion and empty ritual. Instead, may our eyes be open to the spiritual realities. May our prayers rise before your throne like incense. And may our faith today put a smile on your face. We gather here in your name to praise and worship you. We love you, Lord. Amen. Oh, this is the children now. I'm going to go to Sunday school and play a special song for the rest of
Our scripture today is from Romans chapter 9, verses 22 to the end, which is 33. And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory on us? the ones he also called, not only the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As it also says in Hosea, I will call not my people, my people, and she who is unloved, be loved. And it will be in the place where they were told, you are not my people. There, they will be called sons of the living God. But Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of Israelites is like the sands of the sea, only the remnant will be saved, since the Lord will execute his sentence completely and decisively on the earth. And just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stones, as it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over, and a rock to trip over, and the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Yeah, well, good morning. My name is Miranda. As Stacy said, um, I grew up... I did. <laughs> Lots of things to remember. Um, I grew up in this church a long time ago. Um, I live not too far away in Greeley. Uh, I currently work for World Hope International, um, which is the relief and development arm of the Wesleyan Church. So every year, the Oxford English Dictionary adds somewhere in the range of 600 to 1,000 new words. These range from newly discovered archaic words to brand new terminology and slang. Every year, the OED selects a word of the year. In 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. Though not officially in the dictionary until 2020, one of the runners up for word of the year was adulting. Adulting, a noun which became a verb, defined as the practice of behaving in a way characteristic of a responsible adult, especially the mundane, especially the accomplishment of the mundane but necessary tasks. Most children at some point in their childhood feel the longing for autonomy that they perceive the adults around them have. They want choice and power and control with no knowing or wanting the responsibility that comes along with it. Earlier this week, a friend of mine posted to her social media, I am done with this adulting, blank. As adults, we do have agency, autonomy, power, and choice, but perhaps like my friend, feel the weight of responsibility and consequences and expectations. We want power without responsibility, free will without any fallout, and choice without consequences. Let's pause together and pray before we continue. Mm. Heavenly Father, what we need this morning is to hear from you. And so, Jesus, as we open up your word, um, we invite your Holy Spirit uh, to come and to speak. Your words and your spirit are our life, and so we invite you here this morning. I pray these things in your name. Amen. So this morning we're going to dig into Romans 9, and I would encourage you to pull it out, uh, look at it on your Bible app or in your uh, Bible, and there is a lot to go through. Romans 9 is a poster child for reading scripture in the context of God's narrative arc. With all passages of scripture, particularly the difficult ones, we need to understand it in the whole story of the Bible. 
Paul himself affirms this through his use of so many Old Testament references in this one chapter. In 33 verses, he references the Old Testament 11 times. So one third of this chapter is drawing directly from the Old Testament. It's a strong clue that this passage finds its interpretation in the whole story of God, not in isolation. I think that our culture is more prone to taking sound bites and sharing them as though they were the whole story than previous generations. Earlier this year, my son came home after school and he told me that two plus two equals four is racist. Curious what that meant, we went online and found the article that he had heard about. We then proceeded to read it and discuss it together. More accurately, Simon hadn't referenced the whole article. He had heard, reacted to, and then passed on the title of the article, which was meant to grab your attention. It was clickbait. Now, I'm making no comment as to my thoughts on the article in particular or its contents, just our propensity to take things out of context. So we need to read this passage in context, but I think it's also valuable to start with what we know to be true of God as revealed in Jesus. Remembering that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, as we read in Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Jesus is fully God and fully human. He's God embodied, God with skin on. He's the Messiah who came to reconcile us to God, to rescue and redeem everyone who chooses to receive him by faith from the power of sin and death. He is perfect love, he is just, and he extends grace to everyone. God is omniscient, all-knowing, and outside of time. We need to place ourselves in what we know to be true of God first, and then explore the passage from that place. So though Paul had never visited the church in Rome, which was made up of a number of smaller house churches, he had been hearing stories of what was happening in this city of influence. Paul wants to be with them face to face, but until he's able, he has some concerns that need some more immediate attention. Well, what's happening? The first converts to Christianity in Rome would have been predominantly Jewish. Acts 2 records that were, there were visitors from Rome who were there on the day of Pentecost. And whatever the exact means, scholars believe that the message of the gospel came to the Jews in Rome not long after that first Pentecost, and that some had responded in faith and became followers of Jesus. In 49 AD, Jews were exiled from the city of Rome, leaving a church consisting primarily of Gentile believers. And as the church expanded, new converts would have also been predominantly Gentile. Awesome. (laughs) Throughout Romans, Paul is warning the church against rejecting people from God's family based on cultural and ethnic differences. The shift from a church which consisted mainly of Jewish believers and leadership to one that consisted mainly of Gentile believers and leadership resulted in further conflict and disunity when those Jewish believers began returning to Rome some five plus years later. There were at times uh, in history when Jewish leaders had trouble accepting non-Israelites. And in Romans 9, it appears that Paul is addressing those who wanted to write off the Jews and their history. So Paul begins chapter 9 by affirming his longing that his people would place their trust in Jesus Christ. Paul was a Jew. If we remember, he was, the, he was in ardent opposition to the way, and he was the preeminent rule keeper. He knew the law and he fulfilled it to the letter. Paul is now saying that he would exchange his own salvation, that he would take on the curse of sin and death if only it would guarantee the salvation of Israel. His choice of words is interesting, and I wonder even perhaps a little sarcastic, as he uses the same imagery of what Christ has already accomplished in taking on the the curse of death through the cross. Paul's intensity over the people of Israel makes me think about my own kids. As a parent, who do I feel most upset and frustrated with? And who do I long for the best for? It's not the people at arm's length from me, it's my children who I'm supposed to guide into maturity. It's the ones I am closest to, the ones I have influence over, the ones I love more than I could even express. I wonder if this is what Paul is feeling as he begins this section of the letter, both deep love and deep frustration. Paul is heartbroken that the Jews continue to trust their own obedience to the law instead of Jesus. 
the rejection of God by God's people is that much more tragic because they had been the recipients of God's favor, his adoption, his glory, the covenant, the law, and worship. Israel's claim of being God's chosen people is in question, as is the character and faithfulness of God. Has God done a bait and switch? This brings us to the thesis of chapters 9 through 11 in verse 6. Paul unequivocally states it's not as though God's word had failed. God's covenant with Abraham, his, words was, his word was, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The Jews understood their position as God's chosen people to be based on two things, their genealogy and their obedience to the law, both of which it now seems that Paul has rejected as identifiers of God's people. Of course, non-Israelites throughout history had been received into God's family, but they had to follow the Jewish law, and it was a very small minority. And suddenly it's the Jews who find themselves in the minority. So Paul begins by defending his thesis that God's word has not failed by showing that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all chosen to be part of God's covenant without having done anything. The patriarchs and the nation of Israel had received God's unmerited favor. God made a decision based on his own divine will, not on job applications, resumes, or a carefully designed selection process. In verse 8, Paul contrasts these words, children of the flesh and children of the promise. And he's reminding us that God's mercy extends to people first, before they are able to receive it. And that God's choice isn't based on our merit. Neither Isaac nor Jacob would have been the ones culturally to carry on the family line. Both were the second born males and had less rights and inheritance than their older brothers. In the case of Jacob and Esau, Paul writes, even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose of election might continue, not by works, but by his call, she was told the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. Election. That's a word I know I can react quite strongly to that God has chosen to save some people from destruction, that even though he could save everyone, he chooses not to? That's how it might feel at first reading, but the question is, what's really going on here? Paul isn't actually writing about the fate of individuals. Jacob and Esau represented whole nations. God's purpose of election through Jacob as a representative of the nation was primarily about service, not individual salvation. And the phrase, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, reiterates Paul's point. The contrast between love and hate in Hebrew is Hebrew hyperbole or exaggeration. It's the idea that one thing, one person, idea, or nation, it's preferred over the other. That one takes up more space in our head and our heart than others. If I were to use this, I might say, I love my kids, I hate my cat. Truthfully, I don't hate my cat, I love him too but I do have less concern for him than my children. My cat takes up less space in my head and my heart. He gets less of my time and my resources. Well, then the question is, why has God loved Jacob and the nation that would come from his line? It's for this reason, so that through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. God's choice was so that more people might come to know him. This was God's purpose for Israel. Isaac, Jacob, and the generations that followed received the vocation to be a light to all nations. They were to be the means by which all the nations of the world would hear about and come to know the one true God. So God's choice isn't based on our merit, and God's choice is so that more people might come to know him. So in verse 15, when we read, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, Let's not assume that God is being petty or vengeful. Paul is attesting to the truth that God's freedom to demonstrate mercy is not limited by anything but by his own divine choice. God does not show mercy because humans deserve it. The Lord's favor cannot be earned by status, 
social class or works of righteousness. Otherwise, it wouldn't be mercy. Continuing in verse 16, Paul says, so it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. This is the Wesleyan understanding of prevenient grace, that we can't respond to God without his grace being extended to us first, and not to a small select group, but to everyone. In Wesleyan Arminian theology, we have the freedom and agency to respond by then submitting our lives to Christ or rejecting him. So God's choice to extend mercy allows us to respond to him. Romans 2 verse 4 says that God's kindness is intended to turn you from your sin, but it doesn't force you or coerce you to. Paul then seems to go on and digress into a talk on the arts, pottery and clay, objects for common use and objects of glory. The image of a potter and clay would have, for his Jewish audience, brought vividly to mind a passage from Jeremiah 18, which says, So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you Israel as this potter does? declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Paul is demonstrating that when nations turn in faith and trust God, in faith and trust God, that they will receive mercy. Conversely, when nations reject God and follow their own ways, God will cut them off. But notice that God's action follows those of the people. God doesn't arbitrarily determine what people will choose. The words of Hosea that Paul quotes here echo the truth that in addition to the chosen people of Israel, God would also rescue and redeem anyone who believes in Christ for salvation. God's choice to redeem Gentiles is not a choice to reject Israel. And it is God's mercy that continues to save Jews, even though as a nation they have predominantly rejected, them, rejected him. God's people are chosen, but they must respond in kind by choosing God. So, question is, has God failed? Has he rejected the Israelites as his chosen people? Well, we find the answer starting in verse 30. What are we to say then? Gentiles who did not strive for righteousness have attained it. That is righteousness through faith. But Israel, who did not strive for the law of righteousness, did not attain that law. Why not? Because they did not strive for it on the basis of faith, but as, it, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written. See, I am laying, as, laying in Zion a stone that will make people stumble, a rock that will make them fall. And whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. God hasn't rejected the Israelites. He is responding to their choice in kind. The Israelites had taken a good thing, the law, and had made it the better or the best thing. They trusted in their own ability to earn their salvation over trusting Jesus Christ for their salvation. But God has and will continue to extend his grace. So this morning we spent a significant amount of time trying to understand what Paul was really saying through this part of his letter. That was then, this is now. And what might God have for us in all of this? Like the Israelites, we can't rely on family history, on a church or group association for our own salvation. While community is integral to journeying with Jesus, at some point, we all need to choose for ourselves who and what we're trusting in. Denomination, church, friends, and family history don't save us. Only our choice to trust in Jesus Christ does. 
The beauty and power of the gospel is that the creator God would enter his creation in order to restore that which he had created back to, its glory, to the glorious creatures that we were made to be. Pete Gregg says this, the power to choose God's will instead of one's own personal preference is, according to scripture, the defining human opportunity. In the Garden of Eden, even Adam chose to question God's character and intention and take control. Ever since, the opportunity to choose God's will over our own is continually on offer but regularly rejected. In my own life and story, I am aware that I daily make choices that lead me to death rather than life. Choices to harbor feelings of bitterness, to stay up just a little bit longer to distract myself with mindless entertainment, or the desire to be right over the desire to love. At the cross, Jesus took upon himself all the consequences of our choices, the choices to be our own gods, all of death, all of sin and all of brokenness. And by dying, the perfect Son of God offers us life through his resurrection. That God offers us life and freedom through his Son, and that this happens simply by choosing to trust him, is, as Preston Sprinkle coined, scandalous grace. The very end of the chapter says, whoever trusts in him, in Jesus, will not be put to shame. It carries the same essence of what Paul writes about in Romans 5.5, 5, where he says that hope does not disappoint us. Hope does not put us to shame. These verses aren't suggesting that choosing to follow Jesus is easy or simple or uncomplicated. These verses don't promise pain-free, conflict-free, embarrassment-free lives where things just keep getting better and better. They don't assure us that we won't face tragedy, pain, sorrow, or discomfort. What Paul is reminding us is that Jesus will not fail, that he has already overcome sin and death, and that we can place our trust and hope in him because it's a sure thing, both in this life and in the one to come. So I wonder if this morning God is inviting us to make a choice and what that choice will likely look like. Uh, what that choice will look like will be slightly different for each of us. Perhaps it's a choice to take another step in faith towards Jesus. Perhaps the choice is to say yes to believing that Christ took on the consequences of sin and death for you so that you might have life. Perhaps the choice is to say no to something that's taken priority over God. Perhaps the choice is to be willing to listen again. Perhaps the choice is to trust when you don't know where that's going to lead. Maybe the choice is to love someone difficult. Maybe the choice is to establish healthy boundaries. Maybe it's a choice to take on a new spiritual discipline or the choice to let something go. Maybe it's a choice to be still and know that he is God. Maybe it's the choice to forgive. I think ultimately it's the invitation to choose to keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says that we run the race, that we do this life by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. To choose the way of Jesus is unlike anything else. And this, this simple phrase, Jesus, I choose to trust you, is a radical declaration if we moment by moment decide to live it out. As we follow the example and way of Jesus, the very real possibility is that others will see and be invited to choose the fullness of life that Jesus offers too. And the choice to follow Jesus is a daily choice. It happens in small moments, not in big decisions. Bryant Myers says this, every moment and every action is potentially transforming. We will never know what God uses for change until God creates a change. Everything we do carries a message. The only question is what that message is. Every action can heal or harm, can mar identity or heal it. In this sense, every action, every choice is a silent offering to God a potentially transforming moment. 
So today, again, the choice is yours. Now, as we begin to wrap up this morning, um, I want to invite us for a few moments to hold space and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And if this is a new experience for you, that's okay. Um, what might happen is you might hear a word pop into your head. Uh, you might have an impression or a sense of something. And you might not sense anything at all, and that's okay too. If you receive a word or if you have a sense or an impression of something, uh, ask yourself if it lines up with what you know to be true of God, and you can ask the Holy Spirit to affirm it for you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite everyone to close their eyes. And you might want to open your hands, which is just a posture of receptivity. You don't have to, but if you want to, you're welcome to do that. So I want you to imagine yourself at the head of a trail, ready to set out on a hike. Notice the trees and what the ground looks like. How does the air feel? What are the noises you hear? And as you imagine yourself there, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit this question. What would it look like for me to choose to follow Jesus today? And I'll close in prayer in just a few moments. So what would it look like for me to choose to follow Jesus today? You can imagine yourself just taking a few initial steps onto that path. Jesus, we thank you that you, that you are here, that you are present, and that by your Holy Spirit, um, you speak. And I also love that um, a choice to trust you can be full of fear and trepidation and anxiety. but that Jesus, you meet us in those places. Whether we're like off running with you or whether we're holding back, that that simple declaration of Jesus, I choose to trust you, that you will meet us in that place. So I thank you for your word and I thank you for the way that you are at work. Would you open our eyes to see you we entrust ourselves to you and we invite you Holy Spirit to come again to uh, this place to each one of us to meet us and to fill us and we pray these things in your name amen
Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Miranda, for being here. Thank you all for being here today. You are dismissed. May the Lord go with you as you go. Thank you.